Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. This particular episode of The Journey Home has traditionally been the first Monday of the month in which I uh, invite back former guests. It gives them an opportunity to go deeper into their journey. Uh, the first episode, they talked about what brought them into the church, and now they'll summarize it and then allow us to <clears throat> ask some additional questions. And that's such with tonight's episode. I invite back a good friend, Steve Ray, who was a former Baptist. Um, is any of that Baptist still hanging around in Steve Ray? Oh, it, the, the whole enthusiasm for the faith <laughs> and love for Scripture, it's not only there, but it's been multiplied. Yeah, I, I, I know that was an understatement yeah. as soon as it came out of my mouth, because I've known you all these years, and, and it's always appreciated when you've been able to come back on the, the show, though now you're traveling around the world much more than you did the first time you were on the Journey Home program. Yep. In fact, it cracks me up, one of the my staff members, uh, Jim Anderson, when he was uh, scheduling one of your appearances on the Journey Home, reminded me that when he was calling you, uh, do you remember that episode? He called you to see whether you'd be on the Journey Home. <laughs> do you remember what you were doing when he called you? Was I uh, in Israel? You were on a horse riding around the Great oh, yeah. Pyramid. Okay. <laughs> That's right. I do remember that now. Yeah, we are filming the life of Moses. Yeah, God has opened up so many doors for you that, of course, you never dreamed of in your in your previous life, uh, and even in, in your process never. of conversion. What I'd like, Steve, uh, is let's assume somebody watching the show doesn't know you from Boo. Uh, give a little summary of your journey into the church. Well, I was born and raised a Baptist. My parents had 12 years of miscarriages, and they both, at one point in their life, came to a realization that they were sinners. My mom, by the way, was on her way shopping one day, had her keys in her purse, turned on the radio, 1954 in Detroit, and she heard Billy Graham on the radio. <laughs> For the first time ever, she'd never heard anything like this before, that she was a sinner, that she was going to go to hell because of her sin, but that God loved her so much he sent his son to die on the cross and shed his precious blood for her. My mom told me, Steve, I fell on my knees on the kitchen floor. I dropped my keys in my purse and I cried out to God and asked him to save me from my sins. Yeah. And it changed my mom and my dad had a similar situation in 1954. They prayed for more children and nine months later, after 12 years of miscarriages, nine months later I was born. <laughs> and they took me and they dedicated me in the Baptist church in Detroit to Jesus. They couldn't baptize me though, Marcus, because that was already, they learned it, that was a wicked Catholic man-made tradition <laughs> that you don't baptize babies. But they dedicated me to Christ and then they raised me to love Jesus and to love the Bible. I loved being a, a Christian kid, you know, until I got to 15, then I got a little <laughs> rebellious. Uh, but at 17, I remember my mother understood the power of radio, even back in those days when I was 17 years old. And she had the radio on one night and Billy Graham was on. And I was pretending that I wasn't listening, but I was. And I always had a tender spot in my heart for God. I don't know whether it was that day she dedicated me to him or what, but I always had a tender spot in my heart. And I remember that night hearing Billy Graham. And it, it, I think he, he said something like, you can put your name in there. For God so loved Steve Ray that he gave his only begotten son, <laughs> that if Steve Ray would believe in him, he will not perish and have everlasting life. And we lived in the country. And I remember slipping out the back door and walking down our long driveway and down the country road, listening to the, to the birds in the air. And I looked up to, the, up to the clouds in the sky and the stars and I said, Jesus, tonight I'm only 17 years old, but I'm gonna give my life to you. And I had tears running down my eyes. I still do when I think about it often. <laughs> and at 17 years old, I gave my life to Jesus out there on the country road. And I've made up my mind and never turned back on that pledge. Never dreaming I'd ever be a Catholic because I'd always been taught that the Catholic Church was basically the most perfect counterfeit of true mm. Christianity. They use the same words. They use their Bible, everything, but it is a counterfeit. And the Pope is the Antichrist and the church is the whore of Babylon and all these things that Catholics had prayed to Mary instead of to Jesus. They had tradition instead of scripture. They worked their way to heaven instead of by grace and faith. All of these misconceptions. And I never dreamed in a million years I'd ever be a Catholic. In fact, I spent a good part of my time evangelizing Catholics. I could usually pick a Catholic off a tree like a ripe peach because they hadn't been taught to defend their faith. 
And I met my wife and we got married and had our family and homeschooled our kids. And up until the time I was 39 years old when I converted, my wife and I had never once set foot in a Catholic church. We had never once met a Catholic priest. And sadly enough, we had never once met a Catholic who could explain or defend the faith. And then our journey, people said, what was it that you saw beautiful about the Catholic Church? You know, what was it like the, the St. Peter's glowing in the sun? What was it that made you want to come to the Catholic Church? I said, nothing. There was nothing about that. And the Catholics that I knew were the biggest argument against the Catholic Church. Why would I want to be a Catholic? My journey did not come and begin with seeing anything good about Catholicism. It came about by seeing the problems within Protestantism. Sometimes you have to find out you're sick before you look for a doctor. I had to see the problems. A number, there are very quickly three of them. What is worship? I realized, my wife and I, that listening to someone preach on Sunday morning was not worship. No matter how many guitars you had and how many speakers and how much you pump up the volume, pump up the volume, that doesn't make worship. There was something missing. We didn't know what it was until we discovered the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. Second of all, I loved the Bible. I have 20,000 books in my house. All, most of them are about the Bible and church history and so on. But the more books I bought, the more I realized evangelicals, even my own tight-knit circle, we couldn't agree on what those words meant in that book. Mm -hmm. Who is the judge of what this means? Should you baptize an infant or not? Can you lose your salvation or not? Over and over, these main important issues would come up and there was no judge. Good evangelicals disagreed. So I had the problem of who interprets the Bible. There was no one. It was me. I had to become Pope Steve. I had to become the final word for my own life. Then the third one was morals. What does God expect yeah. me to do with my body, with my money, with my life? And I realized that even you could pick any street. On one side of the street, you have Burger King, McDonald's, Pizza Hut, KFC. And when I go to lunch, how do I decide where to go? What do I feel like today, a pizza or a hamburger? On Sunday morning, I drive down the road and I see on this side, Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, Nazarene, Assembly of God. How do I decide what church I go to? Americans usually decide the same way they pick their restaurant. What do I feel like today? Do I want to not have a guilty conscience? So I'll go to a church that says everything's okay. Do I want to sing and have entertainment? Then go to one that pumps up the volume with the cappuccino holder cup. You know, you put this cup right here and you get ready for the show to begin. How, does, how did I know what to do with my life? Morals. Because there are churches up and down the street that would fit any morals I want. I pick them based on what I wanted. And I realized both because of what worship was, who interprets scripture, and what about morals, there was something seriously flawed with Protestantism. And it was then I could almost have become an agnostic. I remember thinking, how do I even know the Bible's true? How do I even, who tells me there's 27 books in the Bible? How do I know that? Who, who has the authority to close the canon and tell me? And then a friend of mine converted to the Catholic Church. His name was Al Cresta. I know, you know, uh, we had been him. good evangelical buddies for 12 years. And he announced to me one day that he was becoming a Catholic. The words out of my mouth were, Al, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. You're too smart to be a Catholic. How could you do this? And then my wife and I went on a mission to prove him wrong. And in the years attempting to prove him wrong, I proved him right. And in May 22, 1994, our whole family, us and our four kids, with tears running down our eyes, were all received into the Catholic Church. <laughs> That's the short story. How long after that was it you wrote your first book? Actually, my Because that book, one has such a big impact on... on Crossing the Tiber. It's yeah. still a bestseller. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. still... Yeah. I get Praise emails God. from people who are being converted because of reading that book. And, and it, uh, it shocks me because it was never going to be a book. I wrote the major part of it before I was received into the church. I was explaining to my father, who was a Baptist deacon the best dad in the world, still alive, 92 years old. Him and my mom just celebrated 72 years of marriage. I remember him clenching his fist and saying, you must be backslidden to even think about these things, a Catholic. He was so angry. And I sat at the computer that night and I said, dear dad, you're the best father in the world, so I owe you an explanation. And I started to type out to him the things I was thinking. What the fathers, the very first Christians, before there was even a New Testament, what did they do? What did they think? How did they practice worship on Sunday morning. And as I'm writing to my dad this letter with tears in my eyes again, mm. becoming a Catholic's <laughs> made me a big crybaby, by the way. <laughs> I'm writing to my dad with tears in my eyes and explaining to him why I was thinking about this. And that letter that I wrote to my dad became Crossing the Tiber. Yeah, that's a great book. Now, the, the audience sees you with a hat on. 
You weren't wearing a hat the first couple no. times because that, that's a symbol of what God has dropped into that's your right. life. It's also a cheap to pay. You're with us. See, I mean, it's, it's a cheap to pay. But no, you're We, you're we couldn't right. get enough powder in here for the, for the lights, <laughs> right? That, <laughs> I'm following my dad in this, you know. Um, yes, the hat. It, what happened was when we started going to Israel a lot, this is a whole other story, but I won't go into it now. But when we started taking groups to Israel, we're doing a documentary series on the history of salvation from a Catholic perspective. The first day I was out filming, I was white as could be in the morning. And when I got home back to the apartment, to the hotel where we were at, my wife said, oh my goodness, Steve, go look in the mirror. I went and looked in the mirror and I looked like a red beet. I was bright red. She got me this hat and I've been wearing it ever since. <laughs> And it kind of represents, I view myself now as a Catholic adventurer. I loved the Christian faith and I love the Catholic faith. And I realize that they are true. And what I've done now with the rest of my life is I've gone on the adventure to prove the historicity and truth of Christianity and the Catholic Church. And this kind of represents the adventure of it, the love of it. And um, I can't imagine I've ever been given this great gift of God to do this. And we enjoyed watching your... The videos. A um, couple questions. When you were a Baptist, my guess is that did you think of it as a worldwide church when you were a Baptist? You know what I'm saying? I mean, as a Catholic, you can't ignore the fact that you've experienced the worldness around right. oh. the world of Catholicism. Amazing. But but as a Baptist, did I think of the Baptist Church that way? No, because I think after the Reformation. Up until the Reformation, the church was viewed as one visible unity yeah. because Jesus said, I pray that they would be perfected in unity, that the world may know the Father sent the Son. It can't be an invisible unity. It has to be a visible unity or the world can't see it. And then the world has the right to say the Father did not send the Son. So it, for the first 1,500 years, it was a visible unity worldwide. But after the Reformation, I think, which I now call the rebellion, yeah. I hope that's okay, but... Yeah. Uh, they're, they're, because of the divisions and the fighting and infighting, they could no longer view it as an organizational visible unity, so they became an invisible unity. In other words, Marcus, you were a Presbyterian, but you believed in Jesus. You believed he died on the cross for your sins, and I was a Baptist. I believe this. So there's an invisible unity between us. We may argue and disagree, but there's an invisible unity. I didn't view the church as an organization or as a denomination. I viewed the church kind of as an invisible brotherhood of all of those who had accepted Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, that we were all in the church. Misunderstanding Matthew 16 or 18, I'm sorry, where it says, if two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in your midst, that that was what the church was. You and I get together here and we pray together, Marcus, and it's the church. Jesus is here. But forgetting that he said that if uh, the, the two or three is not the church, it, there is the church. If you take, go to the two or three and they don't listen to you, then take it to the church. Yeah, that was been, something bigger. You've been to, just give a summary of the, of the places you've been to. I mean, it's hard to do, but that you never would have dreamed when you were oh. Baptist in Detroit. Between leading pilgrimages to biblical sites and being uh, a speaker at conferences and uh, doing our movie series, last year, just 10 countries alone. We did a whole speaking tour to th tens of thousands of people all through India, also in Australia, in England, in the Philippines, in Dubai, in Israel, in Italy. And this year already we've been to India and um, we're, we're going now um, to, uh, to Israel um, six times, um, to England to do a series of conferences in England. Um, I just, That's amazing. it's yeah. overwhelming to me. Yeah. It's yeah. tiring too. <laughs> well, yeah, I could imagine. <laughs> I mean, you're wasting away. I'm wasting away. I've lost 30 pounds. <laughs> oh, that sounds great. A couple of things about, about your experiences then. All right. First of all, in the places you've gone, especially in the, in the Middle East, in the Holy Land, in, especially in the Holy Land. What have you seen that has convinced you that Christianity is true? And the reason I ask that is you know as well as I do, right? There are a lot of archaeologists, historians, even theologians that question all the historic sites. Hmm. You don't want to say that ah, all the biblical nativity scenes were all made up later. You know, all the sites are, have been added later on because people wanted to make money. Right. What have you discovered that convinces you in the reality of Christianity? Well, that's, I've been to the Holy Land now over 100 times. 
in the last oh, 16 years or so. And one of the reasons I love to go there is because it proves the historicity of Scripture. In other words, I like to say that what we believe as Christians is not true because we believe it. That's how the world thinks oftentimes. You know, I'm going to believe something hard enough it makes it true. It's not true because we believe it. We believe it because it's true. Very different. The earliest Christians came to the Holy Land looking for these places. They wanted to place, where was Jesus born? Was he really born here? Is he really a historical person? Where did he die? Where did this happen and that happen? Where was the transfiguration? Did these things really happen? And the very first pilgrims came there looking for these places. How do we know that in, let's take Bethlehem for example, how do we know that that's really where Jesus was born, that somebody was really born there who claimed to be God and had this kind of an impact on the world? The very first believers, when they lived in Bethlehem, they were Jews, they weren't Gentiles, they were Jewish believers who lived there. And that cave right over there on the hillside, when the pilgrims first came, where was this baby born? Right over there where those people are praying. Why are they praying in that cave? Because that's where he was born in that cave. And then eventually it was remembered, even Justin Martyr and uh, John Chrysostom said that even at this late date, now they're only writing in 300 AD or so, 200, 300, even at this late date, pilgrims come from around the world to see the place where Jesus was born. That cave, it was known. The earliest Christians would never forget it because because of that cave, many of our two-year-old sons were killed because of what happened in that cave. Mm -hmm. Wise men came from the east, which doesn't happen every day because of that baby that was born there. Angels came out of heaven because of what happened in that Mm -hmm. cave. Do you think we'll forget where that cave is or what happened? No, we still go there to pray. And then Emperor Hadrian in 135, he came along and he says, you know what, we're going to stomp out this Christianity religion. And he knocked down every little the cha- chapels in the shrine and he built these pagan temples over the Holy Sepulchre where Jesus was crucified, over Bethlehem and other places. Then in 313, three, and 325 or so, when Queen Helena came, yeah. Yeah. after Constantine's, the, Constantine's conversion, she came over and she said to the Christians, where was Jesus born? And they said, right under that pagan shrine, what Emperor Hadrian had done, not to the exact opposite of what he intended to do, was he marked those places. Yeah. Queen Helen knocked it down, and sure enough, under there was a cave, and they find graffiti, and they find things that the early Christians had placed before the pagan shrine went up. She cleared them away, and the first church was built over the Holy Sepulchre, the second one over Bethlehem, and the third one over Potter Noster on the top of the Mount of Olives, over a cave where Jesus taught his disciples to pray the Our Father. And from that point on, Christians have been coming to those sites to pray. And the archaeology confirms over and over again the historicity and the accuracy of these sites. Now, to every site we know, no. For example, Emmaus. There's four or five places that claim to be Emmaus. We don't know. So when I take a group over, I don't say, this is Emmaus. I'll say, these four places yeah. all have a claim to be Emmaus. But when it comes to the essential sites, the Annunciation of the angel to Mary in Nazareth, it's right there. In fact, the altar in that cave says, the Word became flesh here. <laughs> I still get the hair on the back of my neck every time I read that. That I imagine 2,000 years ago, there's a 14, 15 year old girl coming in with a jug of water on her shoulder into this cave where I'm standing at the entrance of, and an angel meets her and tells her that the word is going to become flesh here in this cave. So we know where these things happened. We know the truth of history, the history of Christianity. And there are continuing archaeology. For example, up in the northern Israel in Dan, there was a stele, a, a stone was carved out. Many people had said David was just kind of an imaginary figure, King David. He is kind of the Jews had created him to be the quintessential king, somebody to look back at with pride. And that he's, there's really no evidence of it. Well, now they're digging up archaeology of the city of David and they're discovering things there. And up in the north, in what was the tribe of Dan, they found the stone and on it it talks about the dynasty of David and it's 3,000 years old. (laughs) And they used to think Pontius Pilate was just an imaginary figure, kind of the fall guy for the crucifixion. Who are we going to blame? Let's make up this guy Pontius Pilate. And some people have said, I don't mind your, your creed, you know, because all of it is fine. But when you put Pontius Pilate and try to tie your creeds into history, that's where I disagree with them. But the creeds are historical, and Pontius Pilate is historical. And they said he didn't exist. But several decades ago, guess what they found in the city of Caesarea by the sea? They dug up a stone that talks about Pontius Pilatus of Tiberius. <laughs> ah, so 2,000 years later, we find out he really did exist. 
and the scriptures are true and the scriptures are reliable and what the church teaches us can be trusted. I love to go and dig and feel and touch uh, it, smell it and prove it every time. What a great time. experience for you, not just for yourself, but giving you the privilege of sharing that with others, yeah. both those that come with you as well through the different resources. When I had my own awakening of faith at age 21, I think the thing that, that most convinced me was the issue of he's alive. That's the issue. All the other stuff. But the bottom line is he's alive. And I think what convinced me of that was the more I read that those apostles allowed themselves to be martyred for that truth. From your experiences there, what are some examples of things that convinced you even more in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? You know, it's kind of a trite thing to go into the tomb today and come out and say, hey, guess what? It's still empty. But there's, there's validity to that. <laughs> the fact that he's still alive. This tomb has had millions and millions of people come there to visit him. Come and visit that place where he was crucified. To see even in the Catholic Church. I liked how Augustine said it was the church that the authority of the church that made him believe in even in the scriptures in yeah. the resurrection of Christ. But when I agree with your assessment of the apostles, because at heart they were cowards. You think about it. Peter denied him when a little servant girl says, You're one of his. I am not either. Big old Peter denied him. Judas betrays him. The other ones run. Psalm 88 is, I think, a prophetic about the trials of Christ. He said, my friends have been taken from yeah. me. They've yeah. scattered. They've left. And yet these cowards ended up, every one of them, to a man, except for John the Apostle, the only non-martyr. Right. They went out and they gave their lives. Skinned alive. Flayed, they call it. Hmm. Crucified upside down. Dragged behind horses through the streets until dead. These men who are cowards, they would have e maybe died for something that was true, but they would have never died for something they knew was a lie. Yeah. They saw Jesus risen from the dead. That risen Christ not only revealed himself, but he imbued them. He breathed on them in the upper room. He imbued them with the courage, yeah. with the strength to go out and preach, even to shedding their own blood. If nothing else is a witness to the res resurrection and truth of, of Jesus Christ, that is. Yeah. But then to be there and to see how it played out in the land where it happened. In fact, you've probably been able to visit the sites of all of their burials, right? No, oh, I think almost all of them I have. I think Matthew is the last one I haven't, okay. and, I'm, and I'm on a journey there soon. Really? I you, was just in Thomas's tomb. I was just going to say, yeah. It was in, in, in Italy. And on the, oh, I thought it was India. I mean, well, they brought it back. Ah, okay. And it's, in, and it's in Italy. And just three weeks ago, my wife and I were there at his tomb. And then we went to, in Rome, to the island in the Tiber where Barnabas, uh, Bartholomew was buried. And yeah. we went to the other uh, tomb of the apostles again. I, we've been searching them out to visit them and to honor them because these, these men, they're the hinge figures. Yeah. If they had not done what Jesus told them to do, we wouldn't be sitting here That's doing right. what we're doing today. Right. They're the hinges. These guys are heroic. You know, one other question then, uh, we've got a little time for a break, but okay, uh, you visited many places that convinced you of the validity of Christianity. What about the church? Catholicism? Because they're probably Protestant Baptists that do pilgrimages to, to the Holy Land. There are, and they tend to be uncomfortable there to some degree because everything around the holy sites, these places, are Catholic or Orthodox. They're the ancient church. And many the Protestants actually have some of their own sites, like the Garden Tomb, or the, the Anglicans maintain that. And I know that I know Baptist friends who, when they go there, will not go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is the authentic. Yeah. No question where Jesus was crucified and buried and res rose from the dead. But they will go to the other place, the garden tomb run by the Anglicans. I have to say that as far as Catholicism goes, when I read the writings and see the effect of Christianity on the very first Christians, what did those very first Christians do with this evidence? Jesus risen from the dead, the place where he was born, the place where he was crucified, the place where he was transfigured. What did those early Christians do in those places? They built churches. And they weren't Baptist churches. 
my wife and I were talking about this a while ago. We have been to every one of the oldest churches in the world. I don't think that there is a church in the first three or 400 years that we haven't visited, whether it's in Egypt or Greece or Turkey or Israel or Italy. We've been to every one of the most ancient churches in the world, and there's something they all have in common. They may have different structure, size, places. One thing they all have in common is in the front and the central point is the altar. It is the most important place in the church. Even more, you could say, than the tabernacle, because if it weren't for the altar, there would be nothing in the tabernacle. That's it's right. the altar where the sacrifice takes place. Sacrifice. The word of sacrifice is key. It is key. Yeah. Even from the writings, yeah. some of the Didache, which is contemporary with the writings of the New Testament, it says, before you bring your sacrifice to the church, make sure you confess your sins. Oh, well, what church says, come to confession before you come on Sunday with a sacrifice? It's the Catholic <laughs> Church. Ignatius of Antioch, first century Christian, died 107, but he's a first century man, trained by the apostles, talks about the sacrifice, about the Eucharist, being the very body and blood of Christ. And what Janet and I realized was that for 1,500 years, every church, even the first churches built, had an altar, and that altar in front of it had a priest, and there was a sacrifice going on in that altar. And then after the Reformation, my heritage is a Baptist yeah. from the Reformation. They threw the Pope away. They threw the tradition away. And the next thing they went after were those altars. Yeah. And they removed the altars and they put in its place a podium. And in front of the podium was now a preacher. The earliest churches had a altar with a priest. I was raised with a podium and a preacher. It yeah. was a different religion. Hmm. It was still Christianity, but it was a different religion. And that was one example of when I go back and study and visit these ancient places, the very first places, they were Catholics. You know, I was thinking of another thing that um, would have been an interesting jab at your particular Baptist background is that those early churches also had baptistries. They did. But we know that it wasn't merely adult baptism. Right. In the earliest days, we know that. But I'm intrigued that I called myself a Baptist and yet believe baptism did nothing. <laughs> Isn't this interesting? We said it was just a ceremony that you performed to be an outward sign of something that happened inside. It's not essential for salvation. It's not necessary. We do it as an ordinance because Jesus ordered us to do it. It does nothing, but we do it out of obligation. And yet I called myself a Baptist believing that baptism really did nothing. Interesting. But those early churches, it said they brought their whole families. Can you imagine a Jewish family who had their boys circumcised and brought into the covenant people of God at eight days old? They were marked in the flesh as covenant people of God at eight days. And yet those first Christians were Jews that came on the day of Pentecost. And Peter said, this is for you and your children, not just you adults, but you and your children. And it says in scripture that their whole households were baptized. What would have happened if Peter had said on the day of Pentecost, everybody older than 13 can come forward and be baptized and marked with the sign of the new covenant. Circumcision marks the old covenant. But now we have baptism. Everybody over 13 years old, come on up and we'll baptize you. And the Jewish father would say, wait a minute, you say this is a better, a stronger, a more effective covenant. What about my children? Oh, no, they have to wait till they can believe on their own. The Jewish father would have walked away and said, this is not a better covenant than the old one. The old one allowed me to bring my children into the covenant with me. And so those Christians, the first ones, baptized their infants along with the adults because this was a Jewish way of thinking. And Christianity is Jewish from that standpoint. And Ignatius of Antioch, I mean, sorry, um, Origen said, we have learned this from the apostles, that we baptize our old men and our old women, our young men and our young women, and even our infants. This we have learned from the apostles. All right, good place to pause. Let's take a break and we'll come back. Maybe we have a few emails for you to, to jump into. All right, see you in a bit. Welcome back to The Journey Home. Uh, I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and we have a good friend, Steve Ray, joining us again. It's always great to, to see you again, Steve. Good to see you. A couple other questions. Um, one common theme 
that runs through biblical scholarship is this idea that there were independent early Christian communities following an apostle, the Johannine community, the Petrine community, the community that followed James, uh, other communities uh, that maybe imitated Paul, but that they were forced together later. From your travels and what you experienced over there, did you find anything that, that debunks that idea? Well, I, I think it, we'd be foolish not to admit that if, if Paul is the main, he's the father of your faith, like in Cor uh, Corinth, right. that you're going to tend to think like him and have his words ringing in your ears, not maybe Matthew's or right. Peter's, because Paul's the one that's lived with you there all those months. So his words are ringing in your ears. So you're going to have certain flavor of these. But if, you're, if we look at that in the form, uh, sense that they were kind of the early beginning of denominationalism, that Paul, his, he was a lone ranger out there establishing his independent Baptist churches, and Peter was over here in, uh, establishing yeah. his independent churches, and they basically broke off into denominations. I would say that there's no foundation for that at all, not only from Scripture or from studying over there. When you look at even Scripture, when the Pauline, let's use their phraseology, Pauline communities had a problem because Gentiles were coming into the church without being circumcised first. You have to be circumcised first. He's a Jewish Messiah. If you want our Jewish Messiah, you can have him, but you have to be a Jew first to have our Jewish Messiah. And Paul said, no, we don't need to circumcise. You can believe by faith and obedience to Christ in baptism. And when there became a problem in these communities, where did they come for an answer? To the apostles in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 15. Yeah. It would happen in 49 AD. Paul and Barnabas actually came down to see Peter and the apostles and to receive the right hand of fellowship to make sure they were not preaching in vain. In other words, are we doing the right thing? Are we teaching the right thing? Can you agree with us and give us your, uh, your blessing and your right hand of fellowship on this? I don't see divisions. Yeah. Another example is the Gospel of John. Oftentimes it says that the Gospel of John was written by a committee. It was a Johannan community later that gathered these things and kind of wove them into the document, the fabric we know as the Gospel of John. And I don't see any evidence for that because when you read the Gospel of John, it is a coherent, beautiful mm -hmm. document. I, I wrote a book on right. St. Right. John's Gospel. Right. And in doing that, both reading and studying the Scripture and the life of Israel, there's no way that this could have been put together by a committee. You know, they say a camel is a horse put together by a committee because it's so <laughs> funny, you know. But no committee could have put together the Gospel of John. Right. It was written by an eyewitness account. And the very earliest Christians testify to the fact that John, before he died in Ephesus, penned this document himself, a spiritual Gospel that was written by John. Now, who am I to trust? Those who recently say, well, you know, we've got reason to believe it was put together by a Johannine committee in the next century, or do I believe the very first ones who knew him <laughs> and wrote, read it in the Greek of the language that John wrote it and said this was written by John the Apostle? Who, to, who am I going to trust? Well, I'll err on the side of antiquity. And I have personally gone out fishing all night in the Sea of Galilee. One night I went and talked to two Jewish fishermen and they said, come with us, you have too many questions, come out and see for yourself. I yeah. spent the night out on a boat fishing all night on the Sea of Galilee. And then I go back and read the Gospel of John and I'll tell you that what he wrote was from an eyewitness. <laughs> it verifies the historicity and truth of Scripture and what the church teaches. One other place that seems to me that uh, at least has something to say about this idea that these were separate communities. And I know you've been there and that's Ephesus, mm. because Ephesus is Pauline and Johannine at the same time. Were there two communities right. of Christians in yeah. Ephesus when you were there? Right, and Marian too, because yeah. Mary's house was no, there. No, there was one no, community. One yeah. community of yeah. Ephesus. Yeah. And in Ephesus, you had a bishop. You didn't have three or four bishops. You had one bishop, and all the believers were subject to that bishop. And you see it because Ephesus is only 30 miles away from Izmir, which was... Uh, was um, in the, in the New Testament, it was, I'll uh, think of the name in just a second, okay. but it was there that Polycarp was the bishop. Oh, yeah. And Polycarp was trained. Smyrna. Smyrna, Smyrna that's it, right. right. He just had a mental yeah. blank here. Smyrna is Izmir today in Turkey, and that's where Polycarp was the bishop. And the other bishops from around the world, like Ignatius of Antioch, wrote to him as the bishop of Smyrna. They didn't have three or four, a Johannine bishop and a Pauline bishop, because yeah. they were all one. 
And why did John write in the book of Revelation to the seven churches, including Smyrna and Ephesus and Pergamum and Thyatira and these others? Because John was on the island of Patmos, but he was the bishop of that area of Asia Minor. He was writing to his churches. Yeah. They were Catholic churches. Yeah. And the Catholic churches had a bishop. Now, as a Baptist, you could have asked me, Steve, where's your bishop? You would have thrown me for a loop. I didn't have a bishop. <laughs> and there are some non-Catholic traditions that have given men the titles of bishop, but that's a whole different story it too. It is, it is. Does an individual, well-meaning, have the authority to say, guess what, Steve, on this program, I'm just going to make you a bishop. Yeah. I don't yeah. have the authority to no. send you. Right. The word apostle comes from the word send, that right. authority to send someone exactly. forth. And bishop means one who oversees. He has that yep. given authority. Let's take this email. This comes from Don from Washington. As a cradle Catholic, I am bewildered that the infallibility of Catholic teaching on faith and morals does not have more impact on non-Catholics. How aware are Protestants that in 2,000 years, not a teaching set forth definitively by the magisterium of the church regarding faith and morals has been reversed? And can you recall your thoughts when you first learned this to be so? Yes, let's... Let's divide it into two, the teaching, official teaching of the church and the practice of the popes or the church. Okay, we wouldn't have cared about the teaching. That was never an issue to me. We had all these boogeymen that we would put up, the crusades. Oh, the church did this. Now, I found out a whole lot new reasons to what, what the crusades were. They were going back to retrieve those holy sites. But we as Protestants would often dig up the, the, the dirt on the on the Crusades, or the Inquisition, or the popes that did bad things. And all we had to do was say, well, this pope did this, and that pope did that, and that just proves the Catholic Church is wrong. Or who says that the pope can have an infallible teaching of the church? How can a sinner, a fallible, weak man, give an infallible interpretation of Scripture? It's impossible. But then I realized, who wrote Matthew? Who wrote John? Who wrote Romans? Fallible, sinful men. Is it more difficult to write infallible scripture or to simply give an infallible interpretation? Even as a Protestant, I had to admit that the Holy Spirit superintended the pen of Paul and John and Matthew and Mark as they wrote and they wrote inspired scripture. So we didn't pay much attention to the teaching of the Catholic Church. We just assumed it was all wrong. I never read a Catholic book in my life. I never heard, met a Catholic priest in my life. I had this boogeyman caricature of what the Catholic Church was. And every time I'd go punch it and knock it down, and I was proud of myself for knocking down this caricature, but never did I really address true Catholicism in the teachings. And when I did find this out, it rattled my world because how could, for 2,000 years, these men who are fallible sinful men like the rest of us, how could they be teaching historical and accurate and they're the ones that even though the whole Eastern Church was off base, it says Rome was always right. Rome always had the true teaching on the Trinity and on the divinity of Christ. It never collapsed. It never gave in. It may not have been timely. It may not have been eloquently stated. Right. Right. But to look at a list of 264, our heritage, mm. that always taught the truth and never taught error officially as a pope, that has to rock anybody's world. It's the oldest existing institution in the world. Yeah, the particular doctrines of the Trinity, the divinity of Christ, the, the true presence, the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist are not necessarily popular teachings in the cultures of those no. times as well as they are today, no. uh, aren't today, because they're non-sensual. I can't see Jesus in that bread. Mm -hmm. I can't see the Trinity. It doesn't make sense to me. How can a human being be 100% God and 100% man? It would have been so much easier to take the easy road. Yeah. Yeah. But Ch following the Holy Fathers, we just helped truth. Right. Chesterton has this great, in his book Orthodoxy, I think it is, this great story of this knight galloping on his horse, f f being pushed from one side to the other in the battle. You know, He said it would have been easy to fall off on one side or to fall off on the other, but to gallop through the centuries, fighting and staying upright all the way is an exciting story, and yet that's what the Catholic Church has done. It would have been easy to fall to the left or fall to the right or just to stop the horse. But the church has galloped through the centuries like a knight staying on course and never falling one way or the other. All right, very good. 
email from Lynn from Topeka. Someone I know takes the Bible very literally and says that since nowhere in Scripture is Peter referred to as the first pope, that it must not be true. Can we prove the primacy of Peter from the Bible? I think we can do it not only from Scripture, but also from the early church. And again, I, I wrote a book called uh, Upon This Rock, which goes through the Scripture and the first eight centuries proving that the early church, right from the beginning, understood that there was going to be a vicar of Christ, a pope. And if we want to start with the Bible, we can go all the way through the Old Testament, which is talking about a kingdom. And the, king, the kingdom always had a king, and the king always had a royal steward who was at his right hand who carried his keys for him. And then you come to the cave in Nazareth, where the angel says to Mary, your son's going to be a king and sit on the throne of his father David. What kind of king will this be, this Jesus? He will be a king of Israel. And the kings of Israel had royal stewards, and the royal stewards carried his keys for him and represented him in his absence. Jesus is now, John 14, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And in the meantime, Peter, I'm going to give you a new name. You're Simon, I'm going to call you Rock now because you are going to be the Rock. I'm building an office now, not just a man, but an office, the Rock. And on this, I will build my church. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And there is a place in Israel called Banyas today. It's in northern Israel, right on the Lebanese border. And there is a big rock and a cave. And this is the place Jesus took them all the way up there to say, who do men say that I am? And in front of this big rock, and the cave was called the gates of hell. <laughs> Jesus said, I am going to make you with a new rock, Peter. Not this rock where the pagans come to worship Pan, the foreign gods. Not where they throw their living sacrifices into the cave, the gates of hell down where the gods live below. I am going to establish a new rock. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I am going to establish my new church, not the pagan temple that's here. And I will not have this false sacrifice to the false gods, but we'll have a real sacrifice to the true Lord. And Jesus at that moment made Peter the true rock that he's going to build his church on. And he gave Peter the keys of the kingdom, which means you're going to be the royal steward of my kingdom. And what do keys represent? Exclusive dominion. And he didn't say, I'm giving y'all the keys. He said, I'm giving you, singular, Peter, the keys. Right there, we don't have to go much farther than that. Jesus appoints Peter to exclusively be in charge of the kingdom. When Peter dies, does he throw the keys away? No, the keys, like in the kingdom of Israel, the keys are handed on to the successor, to the next. 264 all the way down to Benedict XVI today. That's why I love being a Catholic. <laughs> um, excellent, excellent. What was the name of the book again? Upon this rock. Okay. Upon of course, this I know rock. that, but I want to make sure you tell well, the audience you. there. Tell you because it is a great book, very, very good. Lane from Virginia writes: A number of people in my neighborhood attend a Bible-only church, where they say that the Bible is their only authority and guide. I don't go to the church, but was raised Catholic, so assume that the Bible-only belief isn't quite right. But I am not sure why. Can Steve shed some light on this Bible-only belief and what the Catholic? response is. Let's look at it historically first. The Bible alone idea has only been recent in the last couple hundred years. When I stand on the top of the Mount of Olives with my groups, I always say, see the clouds up there. Imagine Jesus always on the ground. He's now going up and you see the bottom of his sandals and he did not yell back, don't forget to read the book. <laughs> there was no idea there was going to be a new book, the New Testament. Jesus didn't say anything about a book. The apostles didn't even say anything about a book. What did Jesus leave when he went up? He didn't leave a library. He left 12 men. And one of them he gave the keys of the kingdom because he as the king was going away, he left his royal steward in charge of the kingdom here on earth to establish a visible unity. He didn't leave a book. He didn't leave a tradition. He left the first magisterium of the church, the first apostles and bishops headed by Peter. And then they taught and from what they taught came the apostolic tradition. When you read the very first writings of, the, of Christianity, there's nothing about there being a Bible, but there is something about the apostolic tradition right. and the teachings of the apostles preserved in the church by the bishops, who are like the caretakers. They're like the one in charge of the bank. The apostles took this rich deposit Jesus gave them, put it in the bank, and the bishops are standing there with the keys protecting it. 
And so Jesus didn't leave a book. He left men. And those men gave a teaching. And part of that teaching got written down. We would not have a New Testament today if it were not for the authority of the church. It wasn't for 400 years that the final collection of books was put together. 27, not 26, 28. How do we know that? Because the Catholic Church and the councils of bishops determined that. So there can be no such thing as the Bible alone. And when someone asks a Catholic, I'll just stop with this, where do you find the Pope in the Bible? Where do you find purgatory in the Bible? And they always say, where do you find it in the Bible? I like to ask them a very simple question. Where do you find in the Bible that you have to find everything in the Bible? <laughs> right. The Bible right. never teaches this. The Bible says, listen to the man with the keys. Paul says, hold fast to the traditions I left you. There's not just a book. There's the man with the keys, there's the tradition, and there's the book. To a certain extent, this truly Bible-only church is, is even newer than the Reformation itself. Because with the Reformation, you had Luther and Melanchthon quickly doing their creeds, establishing what Lutherans are to believe. Calvin, you have his institutes. But now we have these Bible-only churches where they have no creed, no nothing, yep. just the Bible. Yep. And that's really a new phenomenon. But even another new phenomenon parallel to that is the Jesus and me only. Church isn't important. Doctrines are not important as long as you got Jesus. And that's really within our generation. It really is. It really is. Mm -hmm. uh, and my guess is where you live up in your Detroit, or there are a few of those. Yep, How many, do you address that phenomenon? Many. Well, I, I address it simply the way you just did. It's a brand new phenomenon. We are not supposed to follow novelties, new yeah. ideas. We're to follow Jesus Christ and the church that he established. He doesn't ask me today to start my own church or to reinvent the church. I belong to one like that, where we said, let's scrap everything and start all over. Go to the book of Acts. We'll start all over from scratch. He doesn't ask me to reinvent the church. He's already building his church. What an insult to come to a man who's built a city and say, well, we don't accept your city. We think we should tear it all down and start new because you did it wrong. Jesus established his church. This whole thing of Jesus and me is very American. You don't find right. it anywhere else in the world yeah. even. It's only an American thing. And that's where we, st we it all came along and we inverted the word person, in inserted the word personal. You must believe in Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. See, this is, it's all kind of an American yeah. psych psychology or whatever, but it's a new thing. And this is not taught in the Bible. The Bible talks about obeying your leaders of your church, the bishops. It talks about knowing the theology and teachings. You're supposed to follow the apostolic teaching. Paul did not just go out and start independent churches based on the Bible or just a personal relationship. Paul calls them to truth, mm -hmm. to doctrine. In fact, we talked a minute ago about that first council of Jerusalem that Paul came to with Peter, and they sent out a letter. That The council sent out a letter, and it didn't say, just have believe in Jesus on your own. We're not going to impose anything on you. Just love Jesus. And do, you know, they wrote a letter that was binding upon all of the churches. And in the Greek, it said, we are sending out a decree binding on all of you. And that word in Greek is dogma. <laughs> they sent out a dogma, a final teaching that was binding on everyone. This is very flies in the face of this me and Jesus right. thing. That's right. And again, if anything... What has led to that is poor catechesis, mm -hmm. not only in our non-Catholic world, but in our Catholic world. Mm -hmm. And so you have a lot of Catholics that get drawn to this because they see people with great enthusiasm for their yep. Jesus and me <clears throat> relationship, and they don't realize what they're leaving behind. Yep. yep. Jordan from Tennessee writes, a close friend of mine is a devout Baptist. What one thing would Steve suggest that I say to bring him closer to the Catholic Church? First of all, I would say, tell him you love him. You know, we don't win souls by arguing with them. We listen to them. I've In fact, learned. you have a six-step process that you told me once yeah, about I, uh, I have how so to reach many, out. So many people who have friends that are Baptists or, um, or have family members who have left the Catholic Church, and they, that's the number one question I get as I travel is, what do I do about this? What, how do I relate to them? And our first thought is that we need to argue with them. You know, sit them down and read them the, the truth. I've concluded that that's probably going to be counterproductive. You and I talked about this. Yeah. I come up with six. I hope I can remember them all. One is you don't argue with the person. You love them more than you ever loved them before. You pray and make sacrifices for them. You show the joy of the Lord in your life. So they say, what are you so happy about? Like, I'm a Catholic. That's what I'm happy about. The, the, last, uh, the other one is that you do your homework 
and have the answers ready, maybe books and tapes and things, answers ready for if that person ever does come and want to know. And sixth, I think is an important one, pray that God would bring somebody else into their life because family members are usually not going to listen to you. And I've had this experience where I prayed for someone and within a year, God brought somebody else around from behind, talked to them about the faith and they had respect for this person and it changed their whole attitude about Catholicism. But for someone who has a friend who's a Baptist, we as evangelicals, we did have some very good ideas. One was called relational evangelism. You evangelize by building a relationship. I was using the example, I don't walk up to somebody I don't know in the street and say, well, hello there, how are your kidneys today? (laughs) He's going to say, my kidneys are none of your business. What are you talking about my kidneys? I don't even know you. But if I make friends with that person over a year's time, I visit him and bring him a gift when he's in the hospital. I help his family when they're in trouble. And then I find out he's got kidney problems and he's in the hospital. And I walk up to him on the street a year later and say, hey, how are your kidneys today? I'm going to get a different response. He's going to say, well, thank you for asking about my kidneys. What's the difference? I built a relationship. If we want to evangelize people around us, we need to build relationships. And then we earn the right to talk to them about it. It is sad. You and I both know that there are some non-Catholic traditions that their view of evangelization is really cold turkey. And it's almost as if, in essence, they don't care so much about the person but that they're doing their job. Mm. I'm doing my responsibility. I'm sharing the gospel. And we do know that when you or I or anyone shares the gospel, we're not responsible for that person's choice. We're only responsible to tell. But I do believe as Catholics we recognize that we're responsible to tell everyone, but that there's more to it than just, I've done my job. That, As you said, as both of our... Our present Holy Father and our last Holy Father, when they talk about new evangelization, it involves mostly love and prayer and sacrifice. This is really something that changed as I became a Catholic, because you're exactly right. As an evangelical, I would hand out tracts, and I also knew who was going to heaven and who wasn't going to heaven, because, you know, (laughs) if you haven't believed the way I do, then obviously you can't go to heaven. But as I became a Catholic, there was this much richer understanding of people as persons, And especially John Paul II, I think, made this so clear that we are persons. We are infinite beings in the sense that we are spend eternity with God in heaven. That when I talk to a person, I'm not talking just to a collection of molecules or to an animal or a creature. I'm speaking to a person who's made in the image of God. And therefore, I have to love them. Even if I don't tell them about Jesus, I still have to treat them with respect and love them. And if I really ultimately love them, I will tell them about Jesus, which is why I wear this cross everywhere I go. Because if you look at me on the street, you're not going to know I'm a Christian or a Catholic at the first notice. But if you see this, you're going to suspect, hey, maybe he's a Christian. This reminds me to live my life right in public. I got to be a good testament. But also people ask me about this. I like your cross, and I'll say thank you. I wear it proudly as a Catholic, and then it opens up a discussion to treat them as an individual and as a person and to relate to them and share the gospel ultimately. All right. Judith from Covington, Kentucky. It seems to me that the Eucharist is plainly taught in the Bible, especially in John 6. Why then do our separate brethren not believe that the bread and wine become Jesus' body and blood? For a couple of reasons. Because when you eat it, it tastes like bread, and your senses tell you that's bread. And most people in the world today live based on their senses. They say they base it on faith, but let's face it, in most cases we live by our senses. And when I take this, it tastes like bread, smells like bread, feels like bread, it must be bread. But I don't believe it's the Eucharist, the body and blood of Christ, because of what my senses tell me. Because I know my senses lie to me every day about a lot of things. I consume the, the Eucharist as the body of Christ because a space alien told me so. And I tell this away when I talk to kids because they understand this. We have five senses. They're very puny and measly. They give us a false reading about many things in reality. But when someone comes from who's not around here and tells me things because he comes from heaven, Jesus himself, who ascended and descended, and he comes and tells me that this is my body, I'm going to have to take that pretty seriously because he knows things I don't know that I can't tell with my five senses. He comes down and tells me this is, and I'm going to take it. Imagine me at the Last Supper. Jesus said, this is my body. And I say, oh, excuse me, Jesus. 
I think you made a little blunder there. There's going to be a billion Catholics some year time that think you really meant what you said. I think we should reword that and say this represents my body and will solve a lot of confusion. Can you imagine the arrogance of me telling Jesus to change his words? And yet he said very clearly, this is my body. And because I believe him, even before my own senses, I love the Eucharist. And I could go on and on about this, but... Well, I was going to say that the Trinity and Divinity of Christ and the Eucharist are three mysteries that exactly. we cannot truly understand exactly. or prove with our senses. Yep. A friend of mine, exactly this, he said, I can prove to you this is not the Eucharist. How? He says, with my microscope. I'll put it in the microscope, and if it shows up as a protein, that means it's flesh. If it's a carbohydrate, it means it's bread. And I said, okay, but I want to ask you a question first. If Jesus was walking down the street and I ran up and took my Swiss Army knife and I cut the tip off of his finger and put it in your microscope, would you be able to detect the divinity of that man? And he said, no, I'd only be able to prove that he was a man, but not that he's God. And I said, our senses don't tell us everything. Stephen, my friend. God bless you. Thank you, Mark. What's your website? CatholicConvert.com. All right, check that out. God bless you all. Look forward to seeing you again next week.